turn to Isaiah 44. I would like to also say that when you get these reform movements in place, when and I hope that all of us were here in the couple days that we first set up those reform movements, uh, when you have them in place, then you can go back and draw lessons from those reform histories that uh, you don't initially point out as you're just setting up the way marks. And one of the things that we've dealt with a fair amount in here is that all these reform histories have a period of time when there's a testing process that is carried on among God's people concerning the message of that particular history. You can show that from a variety of ways. But you can also go into these reform movements and identify that there's always signs given to that generation that are signs for that generation. <coughs> and how you relate to the signs determines your, determines your salvation. And that's easy to see, and I'm not going to go in depth on the signs here, but you know, in, this, in the history of Moses, Pharaoh is a symbol of someone that was being confronted with the signs and wonders that were taking place, and he was his heart, heart was hardening as he saw these signs. Um, the Jews asked Christ for a sign in his history, and he says, um, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up, representing people that um, didn't understand the sign for their generation. Um, and, and as you take this theme of that each of these reform movements have signs that are part of the testing process, you'll find that connected with this, and you can you can pull this out of the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy, is that the message that is conveyed in these histories, the wise will understand the message, but the wicked will not understand the message. But the, wise, the wicked will hear the message, and they'll see the message. And this is where the terminology in the Bible comes from that is dealing with these histories, where it says things like, um, hearing they do not hear, and seeing they do not see. Or when Christ was speaking to the disciples, he said, it was given unto you to understand the parables. The disciples who were understanding the message in the history of Christ they were to understand the parables um, because they are representing the people in these histories that understand the signs and understand the message connected with the sign. And when you look at the teaching of parables in these histories, another way to express it is that there will be a group in Adventism here at the end that understands prophecy and one that doesn't. And and I've seen this illustrated. I've, I've shared Bible prophecy with a group of people, and invariably there's one or two that come up and they just flat tell you, I just don't get it. I, I, I see what you're saying, but I don't get it. But you know, 95% of the people that were there, they get it. Now they, they may not understand it fully the first time around, and they're not prepared or willing to go out and try teaching it, but they watch the logic and the argument unfold, and they realize that the prophetic message that they were hearing was consistent with the message of Adventism, and there wasn't any resting of the scriptures or twisting the spirit of prophecy, but there's always a, a segment in these audiences that they set through it with us, and they say, I just, I don't get it. And that's the case in every history. And there has been some, even in this audience, um, don't necessarily see them here tonight. But if what we're saying is correct, then I would think it demands that when you come to a meeting like this, that you have your Bible with you. And that you're reading along to see if someone that's teaching the things that he's suggesting he's teaching is resting God's Word or not, because um, we're not talking about um, unimportant subjects, we're, we're suggesting that we're identifying the messages connected with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the end of the world. And I don't know how people would come to a meeting such as that and not have their Bible with them. I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. I'm just speaking from my heart here. Um, the, the one person that brought this thought upon me has been here pretty much to all the meetings and at the 
end of the meeting last night, they were they were challenging me that basically I should be expect I should be following and you know teaching these conspiracy theories that are being taught in Adventism Adventism and are being sold as Bible prophecy. And I don't have a problem understanding that these what I'm calling conspiracy theories that I believe in the the Illuminati and the Jesuits and the globalists attempting to bring in a one world government and doing it behind the scenes. And I understand that Rome's behind the scenes directing traffic. But I think we're supposed to be understanding the end time message from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy mm -hmm. first. And then that information will be understood in its correct context. But I was getting challenged last evening on these subjects by someone that hasn't even brought the Bible with them to these meetings. So what I'm saying is, if what we're teaching here is correct, this is serious, serious information, and you really will be held accountable if you don't go home and test it. The Lord will hold you accountable. Even if it's error, we have the responsibility to determine that as Seventh-day Adventists, living at the end of the world, when it's easy to see that we're at the end of the world. The earthquakes, the disasters, the wars, the economy, the condition of God's church. How hard is it to see that probation's about to close? Um, anyway, in Isaiah 44, um, verse 6 says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, and I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. I've spoken about this verse before. Um, the first chapter of Revelation, Christ identifies himself as the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and ending. And this attribute that Christ identifies about himself in chapter 1 of Revelation is the characteristic that he identifies himself as more than any other in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 is the chapter where the keys that allows the student of prophecy to understand the rest of the book of Revelation. Chapter 1 is where the keys are located, and the key that Christ emphasizes above them all is that he is the God that illustrates the end of a thing from the beginning of a thing. And the first time that we mentioned this, I told you that I believe that if you want to understand what it means that Christ is the first and the last, you start in Isaiah 40 and you read all the way to the end, to the end of Isaiah, because you'll find that Isaiah is the prophet that dwells more than the others on Christ being the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. And every time you see him identifying Christ in such a fashion, you'll see that the understanding of what that means is expanded and expanded. In fact, it's in this teaching in Isaiah that you will find the definition in the Bible to that proves what God is. The Bible says what proves that God is God. And according to the Bible, what proves that God is God is that he's able to identify the end from the beginning. That is the proof that he is God. I mean, there's lots of proofs that he's God, but the one the Bible identifies is the fact that he's the first and the last. In Isaiah 44, when he's identifying this attribute in verse 6, then in verse 7 he builds upon that. Another, another line of thought about what it means that he declares the end from the beginning. In verse 7 it says, And who as I shall call, and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming, and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid, have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it. Ye are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God, I know not any. There's no God besides him, because he's the God that portrays the end from the beginning. And in accomplishing that work, he says that he appointed the ancient people. And if you go back to Genesis 16, go to, go to Genesis 49 first. Genesis 49, 49 verse 1. So the White comments on Genesis 49, verse 1, and it says... And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourself together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. And from this point on, Jacob pronounces the blessings upon his twelve sons. 
And Sister Wright's very clear, just as verse 1 is, is that these blessings that are pronounced upon the 12 sons of Jacob are prophecies about the roles that they would play at the end of the world. And that's, that's just what she said. And so one, of, one set of ancient people that was appointed by Christ is the sons of Jacob. And of course, we understand that they're illustrated almost completely in uh, Revelation chapter 7. But in Genesis 16, we have another descendant of Abraham that is identified. This is Abraham's firstborn, and uh, it's Ishmael. And in verse 11 of Genesis 16, it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art the child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And I submit to you that the descendants of Ishmael have a role to play from this point on through, through the Bible and in Bible prophecy. The first argument on verse 12 that I want to put in, I'm trying to convince you here about the role of Islam. The first argument that I want you to remember, if you would, is that Sister White said about that chart on the left, that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered. And then when James White published the 1850 chart, which is on the right, um, Sister White said of that chart, I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brothers Nichols and that there is a prophecy of this chart in the Bible and if this chart is good enough for one, it is good enough for another. So that's her endorsement on those two charts. So my first argument about verse 12 of Genesis 16 is that the pioneers of Adventism identified the descendants of Ishmael as a subject of prophecy, and their identification of Islam as a subject of prophecy has been ratified by God's Spirit through the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy. So what I'm going to say about Ishmael is not new light, it's just agreeing with the pioneer understanding that Islam is a subject of prophecy. And it says, and he will be, in verse 12, he will be a wild man. And this word wild is translated from this wild Arabian donkey or wild Arabian ass that we have spoken about here. It's, uh, I didn't understand this until this year. A brother pointed out at a prophecy school in England I think it was this year, and uh, it's, it has a lot of implications because uh, you know, the donkey is in the horse family. Here in Revelation um, 9, we see Islam being symbolized by a horse, and here, right from the very first mention of Ishmael, part of his prophetic symbolism is this wild Arabian donkey. Um, and because it's the wild Arabian donkey, it's translated as wild. He's a, his descendants will be a wild man. But notice, it says, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand will be against him. A few studies ago, we, we touched briefly on Revelation 17. When we present Revelation 17, just to, just to do Revelation 17, typically we take two hours two presentations, and what we did here on Revelation 17 was about, you know, 15 minutes going full speed ahead, just to make some points. But our, the point that we were making about Revelation 17 is that the ten kings who we've identified as the United Nations, the civil government that is going to be the one world government here at the end of the world, and uh, Bible prophecy definitely teaches that there will be a one world government. Okay, so one of the arguments, and this is outside the Bible and spirit of prophecy, but one of the arguments that it's the United Nations is, brothers and sisters, there isn't enough time to raise up another world government. The one that's here is the one that's going to be standing at the, when all the end time events take place. That's, that's totally out of the Bible. You can show it from the Bible. But we're, here we are at the end of the world. And these ten kings in Revelation 17 are representing Ahab that comes into an unlawful relationship with Jezebel. 
These ten kings in Revelation 17 represent, represent Herod, that was not supposed to be married to Herodias, his brother's wife. They are the civil power that comes into an unlawful relationship with the church. But in Revelation 17, 17, as we looked at, it says that these ten kings agree to give their kingdom, which if you are careful with Revelation 17 and the, the five have fallen, one is, one is yet to come, and the eighth is of the seven. These ten kings are the seventh kingdom, and they agree to give their kingdom to the beast, which we're identifying as the papacy. So you have to ask yourself why they agree to give their kingdom to the beast. And when we dealt with this the other day, we went into Revelation 13, 2. In Revelation 13, 2, it says the dragon gives three things to the papacy. It gives its military and economic power to the papacy, beginning in 496 with the conversion of Clovis. It gives its seat of authority to the papacy in the year 330 when Constantine moves the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople. But it gave its civil authority to the papacy in the year 533. And the reason that the dragon, and brothers and sisters, the dragon in that history was the descendants of pagan Rome, which disintegrated into ten kingdoms, and when you, when you follow the dragon power moving through history, you'll find that one of the characteristics of the dragon power is the number ten. So the ten <coughs> kings of pagan Rome is saying, this is the dragon power, there's ten. And at the end of the world, these ten kings that receive one kingdom, this is the dragon power. That's why in Testimonies to Ministers, page 38, Sister White says, kings, governors, and rulers have taken upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon. Those who make war with the saints. These ten kings, at the end of the world, are going to give their civil authority to the papacy, but Jesus is the God that portrays the end from the beginning, so when we go back to the beginning of the papacy, we find that in 533, Justinian gave the civil authority of pagan Rome to the papacy because there was a religious crisis going on and the world was falling apart. And the world was falling apart. His kingdom was being torn apart by the trumpet power. We're suggesting that when this history is repeated, it will be a trumpet power that is bringing the entire world to its knees. The seventh trumpet, the third woe, which we're identifying as Islam. So the first time the papacy received the civil authority from the dragon, a trumpet power was bringing the world to its knees. And in Revelation 17, once again, the dragon power is going to give its civil authority to the papacy. And we're suggesting here that this is exactly what's identified in verse 12 of Genesis 16. It says that he will be a wild man. The descendants of Ishmael will be a wild man. Islam, at the end of the world, will be wild men, and their hand will be against every man. And the, this, the hand in Bible prophecy is one of the simplest symbols for Adventists to understand, because we understand the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast can be in your forehead, it can be in your hand. hand. If it's in your forehead, it means that you believe it. If it's in your hand, it's because you're being forced, you're being subjected into it. The hand is talking about the exercise of force. And this, this verse is saying that Islam, it's going to use its hand against every man, and in so doing, it's going to cause a crisis where every man's hand in the world is going to come together against him. That's the prophecy here of the descendants of Ishmael. Now, if you go to um, chapter 17 and verse 20, speaking of Ishmael, it says, And as for Ishmael, this is Genesis 17, verse 20, As for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Are you reading along with me? Yes. yes. Well, Ten princes shall he beget. Well, well, beget. Well, well, it says 12. And in Bible prophecy, the number 12 represents God's kingdom. Whether it's the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 disciples, the 12 foundations to
to the city, when you see the number 12, if the context fits, it is telling you that somehow, some way, this particular passage that's employing the number 12 has a connection to God's kingdom. And this is the case with Ishmael and his descendants. He is the firstborn of Abraham. He is not the inheritor of the covenant promises. But as you track his history through the Old Testament, you will find that the what has come to known the most common phrase of his descendants in the Old Testament, the children of the East, is you track the children of the East and other expressions of the descendants of Ishmael through the Old Testament, you will find that they always have a relationship with God's people and that they're always a blessing and a curse. And this is important to factor in. We've already taught some things here that we didn't point out, that we're going to point out, Lord willing, as we proceed. Identifying that Ishmael is a blessing and a curse is one of the characteristics of Islam, or the children of the East, through biblical history and post-biblical history. Um, it was the Ishmaelite traders that preserved Joseph when his brothers were going to kill him. He, they were a blessing. It was the wise men from the East that tried, provided the financial ability for Joseph to flee into Egypt when they were trying to kill Christ. As you track the story of the children of the East, they are at times a blessing to God's people, but there are times when God's people were in apostasy and the Lord allowed the children of the East to attack God's people and bring a curse upon them. A classic illustration of Israel, of Islam at the end of the world is in Numbers 22. And in Numbers 22, that's the story just before the children of Israel were going into the Promised Land. And if you remember, King Balak, he hired Balaam. And Balaam is associated with the children of the East. And Balak hired Balaam to curse Israel, remember? But could he curse Israel? Every time he tried to curse Israel, he pronounced a blessing. Balaam is a symbol in, in at least one line of prophecy of Islam in Bible prophecy and its teaching that Islam is a blessing and a curse. As he tried to curse Israel, he blessed them, and this comes down through history. When you get to post-biblical times, you will find that um, had not, in the history of the first woe, had not Islam wrapped itself around Europe, and it would it would not have, then Catholicism would have spread around the world, but Islam was the tool the Lord used to keep Catholicism isolated to Europe. As bad as it was, it would have been worse if it could have spread all over the whole world, and the tool that the Lord used to prevent that cancer from spreading further was Islam. It was a blessing, even though at that time it was bringing the curse of warfare to the Europeans. If you're familiar with the two streams of Bible translations. Um, the one that we favor in Adventism, thankfully, is what they call the received text. It's the text they use to produce the King James Bible, as opposed to the Vaticanist text. But the received text, which we understand to be the best text for the Bible, they were preserved by the scholars of Islam during their, their glory days when they were in power and they raised up university. They had great love for education and that love for education the Lord used to use them to be the ones that preserved the received text of the Bible. So though they're bringing the warfare to Europe, they're also being used to preserve the Word of God. You go into the early writings of Martin Luther, he will tell you that the deliverer of the Protestant Reformation was Islam. Because every time that the Pope would send an army to snuff out the Protestant reformers, Islam would invade from the north, and those armies would have to reverse and protect against Islam. Sister White even comments on that in great controversy. So the role of Islam is to bring every man's hand together against Islam at the end of the world, but its prophetic characteristic includes both that it's a blessing and a curse. And we've touched upon that a, a little bit without identifying it in the fact that in Revelation 9, verse 4, the 
first three verses of Revelation 9 identify the key that allows Islam to come into history. And we pointed out yesterday that that key was a long drawn out war between Rome and Persia. And when Persia was finally defeated, Rome was also defeated in the sense that it was powerless to prevent the rise of Islam. That's the first three verses of Revelation 9. But in, the ver in verse 4, you have a pronouncement to hurt not those that have the seal of God. And we spoke about um, the fact that Abu Bakr um, had a command uh, not to hurt the Sabbath-keeping Christians, but go ahead and force the Sunday-keeping Christians to convert to Islam um, or lose their head. And I, I just read a paper uh, today by um, Brother Glenn, and he quotes from Surah 9, which the, the chapters of the Quran are called surahs. And in Surah 9, uh, he, he wasn't making the point I'm making, and if I, I have the paper here, but I'm not going to get it out, I'm just going to tell you about it, I can't go right to it. Um, there was a, there's a, a passage in that surah that says that the Muslims are not supposed to hurt those that believe things as they do and understand the end of the world judgment, and that's a paraphrase. So even in the Quran, um, you can see a command to protect uh, God's faithful people, along with the command of Abu Bakr. Um, now, that being said, let me show you something, if you will, where I disagree with the pioneers of Adventism, and, and then let me explain why I think they were incorrect, and then try to explain why that's worth taking note of. In Go, go to Revelation 9, if you would, Verses 14 and 15. Revelation 9, verse 14 and 15 is the beginning of the second woe, the sixth trumpet. And it says, saying, verse 14 says, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. And if you read the trumpets, You'll see this expression, the third part of the sea, or third part of the trees, or third part of the men. Throughout the trumpets, all seven trumpets, you'll see this reference to a third. And what that is identifying is that Western Rome was divided into three parts, and Eastern Rome was divided into three parts. And when you look closely at the passages where a third is being used, it's invariably identifying a specific part of either the Eastern or Western Empire of Rome. And here, it's saying that the Islam of the Sixth Trumpet was going to finish off the third part of Eastern Rome, which it did in 1453 when it blew down the walls of Constantinople and brought Eastern Rome to an end. But this time prophecy was the time prophecy that the Millerites understood, and every Millerite preached on this time prophecy. It was not simply Josiah Litch. Sometimes we Seventh-day Adventists here at the end of the world, we read what Sister White says about Josiah Litch making a prediction about the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and we think that he was one of the Millerite preachers that came to this conclusion, but they were all teaching it. And you should know that now, because all of them we're using that chart on the left exclusively. They were all teaching these messages. And they were teaching that based upon this time prophecy, which they identified as beginning on July 27, 1449, that it would conclude, ultimately, Litch calculated it out right down to the day, that it would conclude on August 11, 1840. And as we have mentioned, this is where the book becomes sweet in John's mouth because on August 11, 1840, when this prophecy is confirmed, the year-day principle of Bible prophecy is confirmed, and the message that the Millerite had been proclaiming um, was confirmed. That they'd been using the year-day principle, and it had been ratified by heaven with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and that's when it became sweet to the Millerites. But, because... That was such a significant um, event in, their, in the Millerite history. It was such a significant prophecy in the Millerite history 
the Millerites believed and taught that on August 11th, 1840, the sixth trumpet concluded. But it didn't. It didn't. And I, I had understood for myself that it, that it didn't conclude. Um, but I was aware that that it was a little bit hard to explain and that very few people were going to just take my word at it. But we were in Germany. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story now to try to um, put this in perspective for us. We were in Germany during a prophecy school. And there, I haven't seen anyone like I'm going to explain in this meeting, so you have no reason to take offense about what I'm saying. There hasn't been one person like this in this meeting this week. But sometimes in meetings, you have people that are attending the meetings that are just unbalanced in so many ways that before the meeting's over, you figure that out and you start making sure that you don't let those people gobble up all your time because you're there to answer questions for people that are, are serious about what they're hearing. And there was a guy that was really unbalanced. Uh, and from what I understand, he's still there um, at this meeting in Germany. And... Uh, he came to me and he says, the, the pioneers were wrong on the trumpets. And, and the reason that they want to make this claim is so they can take the trumpets and place them at the end of the world, which if you do, you're destroying the foundations of Adventism. They want to say the trumpets, all seven of them are some events at the end of the world. Pioneers understood. The pioneers believed the sixth trumpet concluded on August 11, 1840. They were wrong. But this unbalanced man came to me and he says, well, I don't remember exact words, but basically he says this, William Foy said in 1842 that the sixth trumpet hadn't sounded yet. And when he said that to me, I just thought, okay, fine. So I just, I just never thought about it again. And from, from the German prophecy school, we went to a camp meeting in Switzerland. And in Switzerland, there was a really nice guy there that was really understood his stuff, seemed as balanced as you could get. And we got into discussion, and he says, well, how do you, when you're teaching the trumpets like the pioneers, how do you deal with the fact that William Foy, in 1842, said the sixth trumpet hadn't sounded yet? And then I thought, oh, on the testimony of two, <laughs> you've got to figure this one out. So uh, I had the Pioneer CD wrong with me, which has William Foy's visions on it, and I went to my room immediately and uh, looked it up. And now, now let me back up. If you're not familiar with it, when the pioneers of Adventism, the first tracts that they begin to write to defend the ministry of Sister White as being the spirit of prophecy, when they first started writing articles to defend that she'd been given the prophetic, prophetic gift, they always started by identifying what took place with Hazen Foss and William Foy. And they always identified that Hazen Foss and William Foy were given the genuine ministry of the spirit of prophecy. They, they weren't there. You're not going to find any pioneers saying that Hazen Foss and William Foy, that that was some kind of false prophecy, satanic prophecy, <laughs> satanic manifestation. They understood that the Lord had actually given both those men opportunities to serve as in the prophetic office. So if you believe that, and I think we should, then the fact that William Foy had some visions in 1842 that he went in and got publicly recorded as legal documents for some reason he got them recorded and they're still on file then it means that those visions that he wrote down are valid right now, how many of you are familiar with the fact that william foy had visions that he recorded sometimes we're not familiar with that and he does mention the sixth trumpet but you know what happened when his, when his vision got translated into German, because in Switzerland they speak German just like they do in Germany. And there's lots of countries over there that have their own language, but primarily they speak German. Whoever translated William Foy's vision into the German language must have thought the trumpets applied at the end of the world because they got very 
creative in their translation and they misstated what he said. And here's what he said. <clears throat> He's talking about a, a vision. I'll read the whole paragraph. Near the place through which we, and I'm cutting into this vision to, to hit the point where he talks about the sixth angel. Near the place through which we passed, I beheld a mighty angel clothed in pure white raiment, having a crown of brightness on his head. He appeared to be gazing through the bar, and his eyes, like lamps of fire, were fixed with steadfastness upon the earth. He stood with his right foot placed before him as though walking, and his object appeared to be to reach the earth. But three steps remain, remain for him to take. What do you suppose this vision is dealing with? Three steps. Three steps. He, the, the Lord is trying to teach William Foy about the, the three steps, which are the three angels' messages at this point. But it continues on. He says, Against his breast and across his left hand was, as it were, a trumpet of pure silver, and a great terrible voice came from the midst of the boundless place, saying, The sixth angel hath not yet done sounding. In 1842, William Foy said the sixth trumpet was still sounding. The, the pioneers teach that the sixth trumpet ended when the time prophecy ended on August 11, 1840. But in 1842, William Foy, under the inspiration of the Lord, said the sixth trumpet was still sounding. And the sixth trumpet stops when the seventh trumpet begins. The sixth trumpet ends on October 22nd, 1844, when the seventh trumpet begins to sound. And this is inspired endorsement. At minimum, this is an endorsement that the pioneer understanding that the sixth trumpet ended in 1840 is incorrect. Why is that important? For me, it was important even before I realized what William Foy had said. If you remember last night, we dealt, or the night before last, we dealt with the triple application of prophecy. And we said that the characteristics of the first woe, combined with the characteristics of the second woe, will identify the characteristics of the third woe. And if you go back to Revelation 9 now, in Revelation 9, verses 1 through 3, we have identified the key that brings Islam into history. That's how the pioneers understood it. And we're suggesting that a parallel to that key was the long drawn out war between the King of the North and the King of the South in Daniel 1140. And when that war ended in 1989, then it had the same prophetic effect that the war between Rome and Persia had way back when, when Islam was coming into history. And 1989 takes place in verse 40, and the next verse, verse 41, is the Sunday Law in the United States, where the sealing of God's people takes place technically, technically, prophetically, let me say it that way. At the Sunday Law, we will demonstrate what character that we have prepared in our previous hours of probation. We've either prepared a character for the seal of God or a character for the mark of the beast, and the Sunday Law is the crisis where we will demonstrate the character that we've already prepared. So in reality, before the Sunday, we will have already settled in to our character. But the Sunday law is where it will be manifested. All right? So prophetically, the sealing begins at the Sunday law, and in verse 4 is where you see the pronouncement given to Islam, verse 4 of Revelation 9, to not hurt those that have the seal of God. Then, from verse 5 through verse 12, you have the history of the first woe, and in that history you have the description of the warfare that Islam brings against Europe. So, if you break the first woe up into those three basic parts, and I know that I'm leaving a lot of details out of it, in the first woe you have the key that brings Islam into history, and then you have, in verse 4, a presentation of the sealing time. There's somebody sealed in this history that's being protected. Hurt not those that have the seal of God. And then from verse 5 onward, you have the warfare of Islam, the work that accomplishes as it brings war to Europe. If you remember, and this was a long time ago, when we talked about the 3-1 combination, 
And we started working on these reform movements. And we said, this is the first angel's message, second angel's message, third angel's message, and then somewhat where off here at the end of the world, we will have the fourth angel's message. But in the, in the story of the three decrees, we have the first decree, the second decree, and the third decree. But before the work is finished, the Lord has to raise up Nehemiah, and he secures a fourth decree, paralleling the fourth angel's message. You remember that? And what we pointed out at that time period is that when Nehemiah finishes the work during the fourth decree, which is prefiguring the work of the fourth angel, that Daniel 9 says what? The streets and walls will be built even in troublous times. They're in the, the history of the fourth way mark, Bible prophecy says that there will be troublous times. But the history of the fourth way mark is the history of the sealing of the 144,000. So what I'm saying here about the first woe, fifth trumpet, is that you have the history in verses 5 through 12 of the troublous times. Islam is the power in Bible prophecy that brings the troublous times. Ishmael's descendants' hand will be against every man, and every man's hand will be against them. They're the troublous times. And verses 5 through 12 of Revelation 9 is describing the troublous times in the first woe, but verse 4 is describing the sealing time, which is represented by Nehemiah finishing the streets and walls, and Nehemiah getting up on the wall and not getting down. And what does the wall represent according to Christ? The law. The law of God. It's in, the, it's in this time period that the Sabbath is going to be proclaimed more fully. So, if, now, now follow me, if you remember a triple application of prophecy, take the characteristics of the first, combine it with the second, it will establish the third. What I'm saying to you is that from Bible prophecy, you can recognize that when the 144,000 are sealed, that it will take place in troublous times. And the troublous times are also the, the distress of nations of Luke 21 25. Do you remember Luke 21 25 when we dealt with that? The signs of Luke 21, and the falling of the stars in verse 25, and then it says, and the distress of nations, and the distress of nations that, that led to the Millerite history was the war that Islam was trying to reestablish. The, trouble, the distress of nations is prefiguring the troublous times of the ceiling of the 144,000. And you can show that from a variety of ways. So when you get to the second woe, the sixth trumpet, and you see the 391 years and 15 days of this time prophecy of the Ottoman Empire, what you're seeing represented there is... 391 years and 15 days of warfare being brought against the armies of Rome. And if you end the Sixth Trumpet in 1840, like the pioneers do, then what you cut off of the Sixth Trumpet is 1840 to 1844. And Sister White says in the Great Controversy, page 611, that the Advent Movement of 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. And in the next paragraph, she says, it will be similar to that of Pentecost. And Pentecost is the, the history that is most often referred to to illustrate the latter rain. And the latter rain is the fourth angel's message. And the fourth angel's message is the fourth decree of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah's finished his work in troublous times, therefore the latter rain is going to take place in troublous times. Therefore, 1840 to 1844 is illustrating the time period of the sealing of the 144,000. It takes place in troublous times, and if you leave off 1840 to 1844 from the sixth trumpet, then all you have in the second woe is the warfare of Islam. But the most important aspect of the third woe is not that Islam reinitiated uh, its role in Bible prophecy on September 11, 2001. The most important aspect of the, the third woe is that it's identifying that we've reached the time period 
when God is willing to seal the 144,000 and that the purification process that produces the 144,000 has began. And you have a testimony in the first woe in verse 4. Hurt not those that have the seal of God. And 1840 to 1844 is a second testimony to the fact that in the third woe, not only do you have the warfare of Islam, but you have the sealing of the 144,000. Amen. Is that too big of a piece of pie? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but we got it on the record. Go, go with me, if you would, to Revelation 11, verse 14. We've discussed this a little bit, but we want to move beyond verse 14 now. Verse 14 says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quick. Quickly. Verse 14 of Revelation 11. And in verse 15 it says, And the seventh angel sounded. Now, brothers and sisters, we're now in the passage of Scripture that the, the Millerites use to identify that the seventh trumpet begins on October 22nd, 1844. Here in verse 15 it says, The second woe is past. That's the sixth trumpet. The second woe is the sixth trumpet. And then in verse 15, it says, the seventh angel sounded. He's sounding his trumpet, and it begins to give us some details about the history of the seventh trumpet, and it, 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 it finalizes this thought in verse 19, when it says, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hell. When the temple of when was the temple of God opened in heaven that we can see the Ark of the Testament? October twenty second, eighteen forty four. This is the the pioneer logic. The seventh angel begins to sound when the temple is opened in heaven, and with these verses, they also would go back to Revelation ten verse six and seven. And Revelation ten verse six and seven says. This mighty angel that came down out of heaven and put his foot upon the land and sea, this mighty angel that says, that Sister White says, is no less a person than Jesus Christ. By verse 6, he says, And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. We have correctly understood that this is October 22nd, 1844. That is a foundational understanding. The Millerites believe that. But you know how they believed it? They believed that on October 22nd, 1844, the Lord was going to return to the earth, and that would be the end of time, of, of probationary time. So they were right that this verse was marking October 22nd, 1844. And we understood afterwards that it's not identifying the end of probationary time, it's identifying the end of prophetic time. And Sister White has commented on this verse over and over. And then in verse 7 it says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, this is the seventh trumpet again, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the mystery of God is finished during the investigative judgment, the antitypical day of atonement that began on October 22nd, 1844, and concludes when Michael stands up and human probation closes. So that's that's the logic of the Millerites identifying that the seventh trumpet began on October 22nd, 1844. So if you go back to chapter 11 of Revelation, <clears throat> we're moving on to the next point, and we'll, we'll get close to finalizing this point, perhaps, before we have to take our break. But in, in verse 15 it says, And the seventh angel sounded, <clears throat> and it gives us characteristics of what takes place in the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And when did the seventh trumpet begin to sound? October 22nd, 1944. Everyone understand that? Okay. But by the time you get to verse 19, it's recapping that. And it's saying, here's another indication that the seventh trumpet began to sound on October 22nd. It says, this is when the temple of God is open in heaven. And you can see the Ark of the Testament. So as this history between, prophetic history between verses 15 and 19, 
is moving forward, you get to verse 18. Here's what we would like to look at for a while, um, probably the rest of the evening. In verse 18 it says, And the nations were angry, and, the wrath, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give us reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. Now there's several things in that verse. The nations being angry, the wrath of God, the time that the dead are judged, the giving of the rewards to the saints and the prophets, and the destruction of those that destroy the earth. And perhaps Brother Duane knows, but I, I knew it once, but it never stuck. I think about 1848, in that time frame, could be 47, 49, Joseph Bates wrote an article on verse 18 of Revelation 11. And he said that all of these events, the angering of the nations, the wrath of God, the time to judge the dead, the roar of the saints, destroy those that destroy the earth, all of those events take place at the same time. They're, just, they're expressions for the identical event. And then shortly after that, Sister White came out with an article that you find in Early Writings. And she says this, Early Writings, page 36. I saw that the anger of the nations, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead were separate and distinct, one following the other. Also that Michael had not stood up, and that the time of trouble, such as never was, had not yet commenced. The nations are now getting angry. But when our high priest has finished his work in the sanctuary, he will stand up, put on his garments of vengeance, and then the seven last plagues will be poured out. I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary, and then will come the seven last plagues. So what, I, what Sister White explains for us is that these characteristics in verse 18, they're in sequence. They're following one after another, and they're in order. And we know that the second one that's noted, the first one is that the nations were angry, the second one is the wrath has come. When does the wrath of God take place? She commented on it in this passage. When does the wrath of God take place? When Michael stands up and human probation closes. Therefore, the angering of the nations is a prophetic subject that is fulfilled while probation is still open. It takes place before Michael stands up. Right? And of course, what we're suggesting is that Islam is the subject in Bible prophecy that, is, that angers the nation. I referred to it um, already once and I can go, go again just to make this point of before we bring this presentation to a close, go to, to Luke 21, <clears throat> verse 25, and, and remember in verse 7, the disciples have asked Christ, what's the signs of, of the end of the world, the second coming? And Christ is setting forth these signs. And in verse 25, he says, and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. And we know about the falling of the stars and the, sun, the dark day, the signs that led up to the Millerite history. But the next phrase in verse 25 says, and upon earth, distress of nations. One of the signs that the Millerites were required to see, one of the, the signs that the Millerites were supposed to see is the distress of nations. And the distress of nations um, is brought about by this time prophecy in Revelation 9, the 391 years and 15 day time prophecy. And we need to understand that. The distress of nations, and I went over it, I'm going to go over here just briefly here again. Islam had bring, been bringing warfare to Europe for 391 years and 15 days at this point. It wasn't quite that. But Egypt was attempting to reestablish the Islamic dynasty that the Ottoman Empire had been upholding for this, these four centuries. At, at, the, at this time period in the Millerite history, the Ottoman Empire was the weak man of the East. It's about ready to just get blown away by the wind. But Egypt wants to conquer what we call Turkey today, 
and reestablish this Islamic dynasty and carry on the jihad that had been going on, the warfare against Europe. And the Europeans looked at this situation, and there was a time when, when I was traveling and I went to London, and I set aside two days while I was in London at a friend's house to go into the old newspaper archives and try to find the, the newspaper history that was talking about August 11th, 1840. And they have in England holidays that we don't have. They're called bank, bank holidays or bank days. And they have certain days during the year where they shut down and have a holiday just for financial reasons. There's no, there's no religious or historical. They just shut down everything. So I only got to look in the library for one day. And, it, and I, never, I never really resolved what I was looking for. Because at this time in Earth's history, um, if, if there was an event that took place in the Middle East, it takes about two months before it gets over to England to be reported on it. So you're, you're looking for August 11th, 1840, in September, October, November of 1840, trying to find um, this history. But nevertheless, the, it was a distress of nations. The front page on every one of those newspapers is the Europeans were trying to figure out how to resolve um, the fact that Egypt had captured Turkey's navy and were getting ready to launch another jihad against Europe. The nations were distressed. The nations were distressed. And what the Europeans did is they interceded and and when they did, they brought this time prophecy of 391 years and 15 days to a conclusion. So what I want you to see prophetically, if you will, you have two prophecies here. You have two testimonies. You have the, the time prophecy of Revelation 9 being fulfilled here, but you have Luke 21, 25 identifying the distress of nations. You've got two prophecies pointing to the significance of 1840. And what happened on August 11, 1840, is that the Europeans put a restraint upon Islam. To take note of that for um, our next presentation. But go with me again. Let me remind us of one other thing. Go to Isaiah 21. We've been over this. And when we looked at it, our logic for looking at it was that the pioneers believed that that chart on the left was brought about by a passage from Habakkuk chapter 2 that said, Write the vision and make it plain that he that runneth may read, he that readeth may run. And in Habakkuk 2, those people that produced that chart are called watchmen. Okay, so we traced the theme of watchmen, and we went and we looked at this previously, which is Isaiah 21, which is dealing with the watchmen, and we went through, um, look at verse 6. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go set a watchman, and let him declare what he seeth. And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, with two horsemen. Now what I'm submitting to you is that this is the watchman of the Millerite movement, and he sees two horsemen. And the two horsemen are the first woe and the second woe that are symbolized by horses on those charts. Amen. And what's pulling the chariots is a chariot of asses, and these asses, this is the same word that's translated as wild man in Genesis 16, 12. This is the wild Arabian ass. This is a symbol of the descendants of Ishmael. This is a symbol of Islam. And the, a chariot of asses and a chariot of camels. Now, how hard is it to understand that camels are representing of Islam? Okay, these are, these are symbols that have to do with Islam. And it says the watchman in verse 7, he hearkened diligently with much... He, and he cried, A lion, my lord, I will stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward whole night, and behold, here cometh the chariot of men with a couple horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Brothers and sisters, the watchmen of the Millerite history, they proclaimed the second angel's message, which is Babylon is fallen, is fallen, in the summer of 1844. But before they got to the summer of 1844, where they proclaimed Babylon is fallen, is fallen, they first saw the two horsemen of, of Islam, <coughs> the first and second woe, back here. They saw the distress of nations, they saw the conclusion of this time prophecy, and this is a third passage in the Bible that says the watchmen of the Millerite time period recognized 
Islam as a subject of Bible prophecy. And of course, the reason that we're making this case is we're believing that this history is repeated to the very letter, and therefore the watchmen in Adventism at the end of the world are going to have to recognize the role of Islam in Bible prophecy if they're going to be among those watchmen that give the faithful warning. Shall we pray? Amen. Heavenly Father, we we hear, hear the word coming down the line, what of the night, what of the night, and we ask that you would give us the correct understanding that we can respond with the message of the hour and give a warning not only to our church family, but those in the world that do not understand the events that are unfolding. We thank you for um, being with us throughout this week. We ask for your continued presence and uh, as we continue, continue to look at these things, I once again ask that you bring conviction upon our hearts and minds on the, the necessity that each one of us test these things that we're hearing for ourselves and let you, through your Holy Spirit and your word, convict of the rightness or the wrongness of what we've been presenting. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen.